Welcome to the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. It's brought to you by the folks here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, and we pray you receive a special blessing while spending the time here with us. And to God be the glory. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 5. I want to read the first four verses here. <clears throat> it says, The elders which are among you I exhort, whom am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples or examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You know, just, just this morning, I was reading this and meditating upon it and going over my lesson, and it was a phrase that jumped out to me just this morning. You know, this text here can be divisive and controversial about how people think a church government ought to be run. And, and we know that, and we know that from the community and from the whole county. But what jumped out at me was there in verse 1, it's just a little something added here. He said, the elders which are among you. Then down in verse 2, he said, feed the, feed the flock of God which is among you. You know, there are shepherd and there are sheep, but he's talking about that it's all one body which are among you. It's all one group, all of one accord. So keep that in mind as we go through this here. Last week we looked at verse 19, the final verse of uh, chapter 4, where it said, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him, in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And we began first, just real quickly, we began by looking at that first word in verse 19 there, and it said, Wherefore. And we saw that that was a term of conclusion that looks back and it makes a summation based on the previous words that have been spoken. Matter of fact, all the way back to verse 12. And <clears throat> we talked about that commitment that's spoken of right there, where he says, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And we looked at that commitment, and we saw that the word has the meaning of making a deposit or entrusting something very valuable into another person's hands. And the idea being here that the believer has deposited their soul into God's trustworthy bank, the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything and anything that we have that's worth having, we entrusted it. We have entrusted it to him, committing. And then we saw the exercise of that commitment, that it's to be carried out in holiness, right living, well-doing, It's well, the way it's described here. And in doing so, of course, that's pleasing to the Lord. And we also saw that it's assuring to ourselves. We talked about how can we walk on both sides of the line and really have it within us a, a confidence that we really know God and that we're really walking with him if we're trying to walk on both sides. So walk with him and walk in well-doing. It's assuring to ourselves and it's pleasing to him. And then lastly, we looked at the foundation of the commitment. He says, as unto a faithful creator... And he's speaking of the one who is in control of all things, the author of all things. And we saw who better to entrust that which is most valuable, the soul of man. You know, there's none higher and there's none faithful. And I said last week, I mentioned it a couple times, and I'm getting something in my eye here. But the main emphasis and the main point I wanted us to take away from this is there is much to be profited in the life of a believer by their being persuaded of the power of God, of having a true and real confidence, a full persuasion of his mighty power. That makes it a whole lot easier for us to be able to entrust anything to him and just put it in his hands. Now, this morning, we're moving here into chapter 5, and you know the text still has a reference back to the previous chapter. Uh, some translations, matter of fact, they begin verse 1 with the word therefore, referring back to that which has been spoken. Of course, the King James Version, it does not. But nevertheless, due to the content of the persecution, the sufferings, the reproaches of men for the name of Christ that's talked about in chapter 4, 
we see here at the very opening of this, ver of this chapter 5, we see the provision of God's grace lovingly providing his sheep with under-shepherds to take care of the flock, to be a help to us. And, and there was a great need of this in their lives, and of those uh, first century believers, you know, given the opposition that they faced both within and without. You know, from within there was always the dangers of uh, false doctrines creeping in. That continually went on in that early church, still goes on today. And then, of course, without, speaking of those persecutions that they were suffering for Christ's sake. So there was a great need in that early church for these men, for these spiritual leaders. There's just as much and probably even a greater need for us 21st century believers. You know, to have godly men called and sent to nourish and shepherd we modern day sheep. You know, those first century sheep, they face many pearls. We 21st century sheep, we too, we face many pearls. We need, we need shepherds, under shepherds. And Peter beginning there in verse 1, he begins by saying, The elders which are among you I exhort. And generally, overall, he's speaking of spiritually mature leadership. You know, the elder is the same leader as the shepherd, the pastor, the overseer, or the bishop. And some of them's referring to the man, some of them's referring to the office. But if you'll notice the beginning of verse 2 there where Peter says, feed. He says, feed the flock of God. The word there means to tend, take care of. Tend to, just as a shepherd with a field full of sheep. Some translations use the word feed as uh, they use a closely related, related word, the word shepherd. And that speaks of a shepherd or a pastor. Those who, whose function or those who functions as pastors within the church. Shepherd the flock of God. That's what some translations, shepherd the flock of God. And again, the word elder, it does not necessarily, uh, it, it's not speaking of an old man. I mean, it can be, but it don't mean that they have to be an old, decrepit man all broken down before they can be a, a, a spiritual leader. But rather, it emphasizes the spiritual maturity. You know, in the early church, in many cases, the elders, they were appointed by the apostles, but by the time that the apostolic age was coming to a close, God had given a very detailed and meticulous instructions in the writings in the New Testament as to the requirements and the qualifications for those who would be spiritual leaders, those who, who, whom he would prepare and call and place in these positions of authority. And this role of appointing was assumed by the local assembly, assemblies under the guidance of the Spirit of God. And the qualifications, they're found in First and Second Timothy and in the book of Titus primarily. But the, this entire system of qualification and appointment of spiritual leaders and their role in the modern day church has been in many cases, well, to put it bluntly, it's just kind of been made a mess of uh, when compared to God's original intents and the original method. Uh, you know, it's not by the Pope, as in some realms, it's not by popery that these men are appointed. And it, I got a problem with it. It shouldn't be by the ruling conference. Uh, I have a friend of mine uh, in a big church in Lexington, and about the time we were going through the process of uh, looking for a, a pastor, they were too, and actually they weren't look, looking, they just get somebody sent, you know, and it, it's just strange to me. But, you know, these appointments, they should be carried out prayerfully, and they should be carried out according to the Word of God. Now, I'm certainly here, I'm, I'm, I don't want to kick over a, battle, uh, a basket of rattlesnakes here, but... You know, here in the U.S. where we live and function in a democratic society where everyone supposedly has a voice, uh, God's way sometimes is a little bit foreign uh, to some churches and to some church members. And, and I said this can be divisive, but just hear me out. You know, the result is one, uh, the result of this is one might tend to overly focus, maybe even with distaste, towards the idea of one in authority as an overseer or as a ruler. And what will happen, they'll totally forget about that context, the, the concept of a shepherd. You understand what I'm saying? They're more worried about, well, he's supposed to be over me, an overseer or a ruler, and forget about the whole concept of the shepherd, the one given by God to tend and provide and to watch over his sheep. 
You know, God has given confines and boundaries to those in charge. I'm sure Brother Ralph here can attest to that. Yeah, he can take care of his requirements being adhered to. And, you know, Peter, he speaks of some of these in verses 2 and 3 of our text we just read. And, you know, God can also handle a congregation that refuses to operate in the realm, in this realm, according to his word. In the words of Robert Layton, I've quoted him much through 1 Peter. He's got a wonderful commentary. I don't use it exclusively, but I do read every section. I've touched on him. But I quote him, speaking of how that God can deal with a congregation <clears throat> that refuses to operate in, in this realm according to his word. And Brother Layton, and I quote, he says, It is one of the heaviest threatenings when the Lord declares that he will give a rebellious people such teachers and prophets as they deserved and indeed desired. And he refers to Micah chapter 2 verse 11. And I, he says, if a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. And what he's saying here is that any prophet who advocated wine and strong drink, they would be quickly accepted by this people. What God's saying here, if, if this is what you want, I'll give it to you. Yes, and that is a sad condition, a sad place to get to. You remember the Apostle Paul said to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. He told Timothy, he said, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Now get this, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. So it, it is a heavy threatening that God can get so fed up with us, with believers even, that he removes the spiritually mature leaders. You know, that shepherd can become replaced with a hireling. We've all, and it's a sad, sad shape. But let's now look at the more, uh, something a little more positive here. You know, uh, God greatly, he, he cares greatly for his church. And therefore, he cares much for the spiritual well-being of his church. And therefore, he has provided for us. Uh, how much does he love his church? Well, we know from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's how much he loves his church. It's a bride of his son. He gave of his life, suffered and bled and died for us. Last week, you know, when we talked about the faithful creator, you know, we saw committing our souls unto him and well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And we looked at that little phrase, a faithful creator. And we saw that wrapped up in God's faithfulness is his faithfulness to his son. <coughs> wonderful, wonderful thought. He cares about the spiritual welfare of his people. And he has given to us provisions and gifts in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, it says, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, one of the sweetest promises of mercy is that God's people will be provided with plenty of faithful pastors and teachers. That is mercy. That is grace given unto us. You know, speaking through the prophets to Israel, the word of God says, and yes, it's looking off to the future, but in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 20, it says, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, ye shall not, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more. But thine eyes shall see the teachers. A similar thought is stated over in Jeremiah chapter 3, in verse 14, it says, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and will bring you to Zion. And get this, he said, and I will give you pastors according to mine own heart, to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. 
We can't take this lightly. You know, God has richly blessed his church with his provision of spiritual leaders, uh, true under-shepherds. And again, we shouldn't take that provision lightly. We shouldn't take it grant for granted. And you know, that applies to both sides. Both It applies to both sides, those who sit in authority as well as those who are subject to that authority or to that spiritual leadership. You know, another very sober and concise and yet pretty harsh warning from Brother Layton. I think he was uh, operating around in the 1600s. And I'm going to quote, it's kind of lengthy. Well, it's not that bad, but just listen to what he's saying here. He says, and I quote, he says, Are you not grieved and afraid? Or may not many of you be so who, who have lived many years under a fruitful ministry and yet are as earthly and selfish and selfish as unacquainted with God and his ways as at first. Consider this, that as the neglect of souls will lie heavy on unholy or negligent ministers, so a great many souls are ruining themselves under some measure of fit means. And the slotting of those means will make their condition far heavier than that of many others. I recall Brother Art used to say, he said, I'd rather somebody go to hell from anywhere, any church but this one. You know, the more truth that we hear preached and the more that we witness, that's a greater responsibility placed upon us. You might remember our Savior's words in Matthew chapter 11, verse 21. He said, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Scary thought. Now, Peter, I want to talk about his qualifications as he gives this exhortation. But Peter writes here, the elders which are among you, I exhort. Now, this is a somber and serious exhortation. Now, it's a serious business both to the under-shepherd as well as to the individual uh, member of the flock or to the sheep. You know, Peter, he's abundantly qualified by experience to extend the exhortation to these uh, elders, you know, Peter had come up through the ranks. He'd experienced just about everything that could be experienced. He'd been high, he'd been made low, been made high again. You remember he denied the Lord, wept bitterly. And there on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus resurrected, looked out, said, Children, have ye any meat? And, and there again, he was restored. And he went on to boldly preach on the day of Pentecost. And history, antiquity tells us that Peter was eventually, he was crucified upside down. He died on a cross. He'd come up with the ranks, come up through the ranks, so to speak. And, and you know, he could speak with authority and he could speak with confidence. You know, he knew what he was talking about. You know, in, in the secular world that we live in, uh, it used to be, for the most part, that leaders would come up through the ranks and it'd be groomed and cultivated to assume a role of leadership. Uh, that's no longer the norm, uh, at least from my experience, and probably many of you have witnessed it. Uh, they assume leadership roles, but yet they, like, uh, they lack uh, life experience. In most cases, they lack experience in the industry or the field that they're working in. They haven't come up through the ranks like it used to. But Peter, he'd come up through the ranks. He had experienced it. He had a tremendous respect. And that wasn't the case with Peter. He was well qualified and experienced to give the exhortation. And he goes on to say in our text, he says, Whom am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory which shall, that shall be revealed? You know, Peter loaded this exhortation to these elders with some rich motivation. He did. First of all, there was that motivation by identification with Peter. You know, he refers to himself as a fellow elder. And as such, he could give a relevant exhortation to these spiritual leaders. You know, when we receive, uh, when we receive an exhortation or advice or a critiquing, you know, it's a lot more palatable to us or it just tastes better. <laughs> coming from someone that we respect, someone we know who's more experienced and more knowledgeable than we are. You know, Peter hadn't just graduated seminary. No, he'd been on the road for a long time, and he knew what he was talking about. And those that knew him knew that he knew what that he was talking about. 
And then so the, there was that motivation by identification. And then there was that motivation by authority. You know, by noting that he had been an eyewitness of Christ's sufferings, he was affirming his apostleship. He had some authority. When the Lord commissioned the apostles to evangelize, back in Luke chapter 24 and verse 46, it says, And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third, uh, the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And then he said, And ye are witnesses of these things. So Peter was a witness. He both saw the things personally with his own eyes, and then he testified to them as he preached. He was a witness. He was qualified by his authority to exhort these other elders. And then thirdly, there was this motivation of anticipation. That ought to motivate all of us. He was a partaker of the glory that should be revealed. Yeah, he not only looked forward to this, but he'd already experienced a taste when Jesus was transfigured there in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. Peter, he had also, he related this to this truth over in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. He made reference to that again. He said, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter had already experienced a foretaste of that glory to be revealed. And you know, the fact that Christian leaders will one day receive from the hand of Christ a reward for their service, that ought to be a stimulant for faithful duty. So there was these three motivating factors. Their identification with Peter as a fellow elder, the motivation of authority, as surely uh, he had these men's respect and he was way on up the road in spiritual maturity. And then there was the motivation of anticipation. And of course, there needs to be a motivation from the Spirit of God. You know, but Peter wrote right here, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint. That means not being forced, but willingly. But willingly. The Spirit of God moving upon them. And you know, we're blessed as a people and a church right here in general uh, that God has allowed men that are called of God and anointed by his spirit and are truly motivated by the same things Peter was motivated by. The same things he was motivating these elders spoken of in our text by. Now without, our, uh, without a doubt, uh, Pastor Ralph, Pastor Art, many of the other preachers who've passed through here, many of us, you know, we can all look back to one like the exhorter Peter who made a spiritual impression upon us in our service to the Lord and to his church. All of us can look back to, to somebody having an influence in our lives just like that. Now, I want to talk about the commission or the task that was set before him. And I'm... Uh, Brother Ralph was talking about his message later. He said, it's so big, I had to whittle it down. Well, believe me, pretty much every week I get into something and I get more information than I know what to do with. And then sometimes it's harder just to try to pare it down into something I can say. <laughs> and uh, so it, this is a little bit broken up here. But I want to talk about the commission or the task. Now, for uh, one more little point here we'll go to concerning the exhortation the commission or the task, we want to look there at verse 2 with that little phrase, feed the flock of God. You know, I've already made mention of the word feed and the word shepherd, which is used in some translations uh, having a similar meaning. But turn over to John chapter 21. That's a familiar text we will go to right here. <clears throat> Talking about feeding. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. John chapter 21, look at verse 15. And we're told in verse 15, it says, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Verse 16, he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? 
He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. In verse 17, He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now here in this text, as the Lord addresses Peter, he states three times that word feed. And although it's the same English word translated in each verse, the Lord is actually using two different words here. And there's a difference in the meanings of them. There in verse 15, the Greek word used is bosco. That's Strong's 1006. And the meaning is to pasture. And it's used of a herdsman. It means to provide food. And then in verse 16, the Greek word is poemano for feed. And it's used, uh, it's used which means to, to act as a shepherd or to tend, to take care of. That incorporates all the shepherdly tasks. And this is the word used in our text, feed the flock of God. And you know, if you study the shepherding or the taking care of sheep, uh, you'll learn that the provision of food, that's the most essential task. Now there are many other needs of the sheep and responsibilities of the shepherd. But then in verse 17, he returns to that same word again, bosco, meaning to provide food. And those two Greek words I referenced are not interchangeable. Well, they are somewhat. One does incorporate the other. You know, to be a... Uh, to be the shepherd or to feed uh, the whole, the, the shepherd task does incorporate feeding the sheep. But they do have a distinct meaning. I hope I don't confuse you here. But in the spiritual care of God's children, his sheep, the feeding of the flock from the word of God, that must be the constant and regular necessity. It's to have the foremost place. The tending, that poemano word, includes the leading to pasture and feeding but it also consists of other acts, discipline, authority, restoration, material assistance of individuals. So our text here says, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. You know, these other acts or these other duties, although they are very important to the welfare of the sheep, really they're just incidental in comparison to the literal feeding of the word of God to them. You know, in our case, the provision the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Uh, no matter what else the shepherd does for the sheep, if they don't get fed, then they, they will become malnourished and eventually they'll die. You know, the shepherd could provide a climate-controlled sheepfold, every imaginable accommodation to the sheep, uh, way beyond that which is necessary. But if, the, if they don't eat, then all of that's just in vain. They're going to die. We right here, we could have every imaginable accommodation of comfort, pleasantries, entertainment, a big grand building. But if we don't get fed from the word of God, we will become spiritually malnourished and eventually we will die or degrade spiritually. Um, we, we can't just eat the sweet desserts of God's word. You know, we need to have our vegetables too. I think I've heard you make reference to that. And, and some of God's word is bitter to the inclinations of the natural man that still dwells within us, but many times uh, that which is bitter is the most profitable to our spiritual health. Health. This past Thursday evening, Brother Ralph preached from Romans 8.13, a wonderful message, thank you, where it says, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die, but if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And his application wasn't that we lose our salvation as a result of walking in the flesh, but that we die, we degrade spiritually from walking in the flesh. This had a little hint, or maybe it had a whole lot of bitterness in it. Uh, it might not have tasted too good, but it was spiritually nourishing. It was truth. It was something to leave here, chew on, meditate upon, think about. And, and this is relative to our regularly being fed from the word of God. Because apart from the provision, or that provision, how can we walk in the Spirit? If we're not regularly fed from the Word of God, uh, how are we going to mortify the deeds of the body? We can't. We don't just eat a couple times a month. <laughs> we just wouldn't make it. 
We need to have that regular diet from the Word of God. You know, we won't grow, but rather we will digress and degrade and eventually we'll die. And again, the feeding of the flock from the Word of God, that is the constant and regular necessity. It is to have the foremost place in the duties of the shepherd or the under-shepherd. And you know, in closing, uh, we're blessed to have so-called, what he speaks of here, elders in the church. Those that pastor and teach, who watch for our souls and feed us the steady diet of the Word of God. You know, God knows what He's doing in this whole realm, in, in all things. He knows what He's doing. His way is the best way. He didn't just save us and turn us out to pasture to uh, offend for ourselves. He didn't, just, just to become wild. As a matter of fact, sheep aren't equipped to live like that. They will die. They just can't do it. They can't become like feral hogs and survive in the wild. They'll die. Sheep aren't equipped for that. They must have a shepherd to survive. And God has provided such in the life of his church as a help to us. And that's a blessing. Now I've just kind of just scratched the top of this thing, but I hope I said something along some word that might have been a help to you and a blessing to you. Amen. Thank you for spending the time with us at the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. And while you're here, please select from our playlist previous messages from both our pastor, Brother Ralph Coleman, and many other preachers and evangelists. So avail yourself of these ministers of the gospel and share with friends and family, and I know you will both find and be a blessing. And as always, from here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, to God be the glory. Praise the